Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to today's second session uh, and this time we're looking into Inventor iLogic and introduction to uh, Autodesk Design Automation. So hopefully the way this is structured, I've got just a few slides introducing what iLogic is and what Inventor capabilities are in, in terms of design automation. Uh, I've got quite a few examples to show so I'll try and power through the PowerPoint uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a good idea on where if you already have Inventor, you can, uh, you know, pick up this iLogic stuff and start working with that. Okay. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, introduction to iLogic. We're going to look at the difference between creating iLogic rules for parts or assemblies, uh, manipulating material parameters, uh, suppressing different parts in our assembly, uh, linking to Excel spreadsheets, how to create form and some of the uh, bits on uh, DWG manipulation as well. Now this is a, a, a case study that I like to, to use a lot of the times from Tech Clarity as well. So, um, so top four challenges for design reuse. So we have model modi modifications required. Cat knowledge is 57%. So these are the top challenges that our customers are seeing at the moment. Uh, being able to have uh, or models being inflexible and fail after change, uh, being able to find models and reusing material, and the ability for only the designer uh, having the, the ability to change the design successfully. Okay, so these are some of the challenges that we see in the industry. And if we look at the top uh, manufacturers here, uh, the top class uh, sort of companies and what they do, and these guys, as I mentioned in my previous uh, presentation, they're using digital prototyping quite extensively throughout their entire process. Uh, now, if you're just using 2D, uh, we highly recommend that you think about moving into the 3D environment. Um, it is a bit of a huge step in terms of productivity and overall benefits. So time to market for it is a big example here and creates many opportunities for using um, 3D models downstream, such as um, simulation and rendering. So if you're just using 2D, you simply um, cannot do some of these things. Uh, and your business performance may reflect that as well. So 3D is better. Um, we can, If we're using Inventor with our logic, you're getting then into the world of design automation. Um, ETO is another that takes it a step further. We're going to look at that. Or you may want to create your own custom programming based on uh, perhaps even AutoCAD. Um, and really, the, the final frontier, the sales automation is the final frontier. Uh, and that's where we can turn our 3D assets and processes to deliver quotes for highly customized products much faster and more accurately to protect our, our, our profit margins and drive profitable sales. Uh, and this is really, you know, this is, that's music to the CEO and the VPs for, for, for the sales. Uh, and if you're um, engineering, you can help them get um, there at the end, uh, the perception of engineering as a cost center or, uh, or a resource bottleneck. If we look at the design landscape, now most products are configured, uh, uh, not engineered to, to order. Okay, and these are some of the percentages that we see in the industry. So we need to have agile and flexible products uh, and change the different configuration according to our customer needs. The different types of solutions we get uh, inside Inventor. So we start from a very basic level, we've got the parts and assemblies. Uh, if most of you have used Inventor before, we've got iParts and iAssemblies. Uh, the, the next step is iLogic, we're going to be looking at today. And then you can take it a step further by using some of the Configurator 360 services or ETO. Okay. And we're going to look at the differences between some of these as well. So intelligent features. So iFeatures is something that if, for example, we have a sheet metal part, we can uh, create different eye features for punch tools, uh, for example, um, or uh, alternate alternate uh, punch representations. Okay, and so really quickly, we don't have to recreate some features. We can uh, straight away import, uh, insert them into our design. So in the past, we had two ordinary workflows, uh, but now we have three with iLogic. So we have eye parts and eye assemblies which are really useful for creating um, standard li library content. Uh, so one drawing could uh, describe all configurations, one configure no additional types are likely to be added. 
we can then use Excel to kind of drive a lot of these parameters uh, in combination with our, our, our iPads. And the new, uh, or not really new, it's been there for, for years, but then the next step is, uh, is iLogic, which kind, of, which kind of combines all these together. In terms of um, part and assembly configurations, the requirements we see here is to be able to quickly design and document uh, families of related products by creating variations in a single file assembly. So in this area, Inventor delivers table-driven assemblies, auto capture mode, uh, full bill of materials and data management support, uh, and full drawing support. In terms of our integration with Microsoft Excel, some of the benefits we see here is we can incorporate logical statements, uh, have models driven from local tables, and create a, a sort of user-friendly front end to drive the model. Okay, and we can use that in combination with Vault as well. But what is the difference between all of these? And uh, I've created a, a quick little table just to show the, the benefits, ideal use, and disadvantages. So uh, iParts and iAssemblies are relatively easy to define, and we can create this really quickly. Are ideal for sort of content uh, materials, content center parts, for example. Uh, and a disadvantage is that it can cause issues if modifications are required once this has been established uh, or generated. And they're always linked back to the original uh, factory file. If we're using Excel in combination with our iParts, uh, we have uh, flexibility to use industry standard tool. So a lot of people are familiar with uh, how to use um, Excel and, and being able to create some logical uh, functions within that. Uh, ideal use is a customer who has experience in Excel and needs a flexible parameter driven design. Uh, disadvantage here is that must use Vault or separate projects to create new alternatives. So we cannot change iProperty related values, which can be really useful. Uh, and ideally have a good knowledge of Excel itself. Well, with iLogic, we have the ability to uh, have flexible configurations using tools all directly available within our inventor uh, environment and to control these uh, in the, the model properties as well. Um, ideal users, uh, usage companies who have high number of alternative designs, iterations, uh, and also the requirements for standardized configuration. Uh, I guess the one disadvantage here, if you want to take it really quite, I mean, you, you realize from my demonstration, it's really straightforward. You don't really need any kind of programming language. I'm not a programmer myself either. Uh, but if you want to take it to uh, the last sort of step, uh, take it even further, uh, some very basic VB knowledge might be advantage uh, in this area. So Inventor iLogic. Some of the customer requirements and what does it offer? So the requirement here is to have a simple way to control complex designs, uh, variants, and to automate uh, the tedious design tasks. So Inventor iLogic basically offers a rule-based design with no programming expertise required. We can create more uh, more intelligent design, uh, and they're embedded directly into our digital prototypes. A good example here is uh, Park and Hannafin, uh, one of the biggest customers for, for Autodesk in the past, and all the content center files that you see inside Inventor are basically using iLogic behind to, to drive the different design alternatives that we have. How does um, iLogic word, uh, work? So we have embedded um, rules uh, as objects directly inside our parts or assemblies. And these rules drive the parameters of our model uh, and our design. So by controlling these values, we can uh, define behavior of attributes, features, components of our model. OK, so that's going a bit too far. So <laughs> let's jump into our inventor environment. Uh, and just to do a really quick proof of concept in here, we Maybe we can start with a uh, sort of sheet metal part to, to show you how this uh, whole thing works. So I'm going to start in part mode and just create a, a quick sketch here. So I'm going to set that to 50. Another line on the other side here. Oops, I didn't look like that. Did that properly there. Okay, we're going to finish our sketch and just create a contour flange for this profile here. I set distance to 100, and I want this to be symmetrical. 
let's go to our sheet metal uh, properties in here and set that let's say to two millimeters thickness uh, let's create a some corner rounds for here on either end okay I'm gonna create a <clears throat> A new sketch on here and just place a couple of points so let's connect these together with a construction line and start placing some dimensions uh, let's place a dimension from here I'll say it to 25 And dimension from here to the bottom, I set that to 28. Okay, and the distance between those. Actually, let's, you know what, let's find the, the final bracket for this and say this having to kind of do this. So we've created the features here um, for a couple of holes on the back plate, a couple of holes, holes on the bottom here. Uh, and I've actually just gone through the, my model browser and renamed these holes uh, so it makes it easier for me to kind of start creating uh, the rules for this. Okay, and I'm actually going to let's delete these ones here. And I'm going to create, this is my iLogic browser. You can find this if you go onto your view tab and user interface, you can activate that. That will come on the bottom here. And I can create a, a, a new rule, uh, let's say size rule. And this is my iLogic interface. Okay, I've got different um, snippets as they call them, so templates uh, of uh, code or iLogic code that I can use uh, because of the fact that I'm not a programmer, I can make use of that really quickly. So really the, the most basic function of programming is using loops and we have templates to do that so and if then else is one of the most typical sort of loops that we can use in this particular example so we've got a condition of if and I have to put my expression here I can go through my model and look at my different parameters here if I look at my user parameters I've got my, my parameter width width and if I double click on that it's going to insert it so let's say that if width is any uh, if it's smaller than 100, then I want to invent it to do something for me. I'm going to use my templates here. And if I go under features, you'll see I've got different templates. If I hover on top, it gives me a good description. So this will get or set activity of a particular feature. So that sounds good. I want to um, activate that. And all it's looking for me is to put the name of the feature that I want. If I switch to names here, I'm going to actually bring all the names in this interface so I can then simply go feature name and assign it to that and then say false so if width is any smaller than 100 then double hole one will be suppressed feature is active is false so therefore it would, it would be suppressed okay and like you would normally do in programming really quick ways to copy paste things I'm going to set the condition for the rest of the features and change this last two to true. Now in here I want to say an else if as well. Uh, again my expression will, will be the same in here but this time I'm going to set it to uh, higher or equal to the 100 and simply copy these and paste them below and I'm just going to toggle the difference between these. Finally, I like to add uh, in here the update document when done. So this is going to update my interface. So if I go inside my parameters, I've created a width parameter, which is a multi-value. So I can switch from uh, a 50 millimeter to 100 millimeters. So if I switch to 50, uh, because of my analytic rule, it automatically knows that it can suppress uh, the holes, okay? So we can talk between and see how the iLogic rule is working. 
Now, the advantage with iLogic, of course, is that we can also manipulate eye properties. Uh, actually, I might show you this in, into when, in our next example. So let's um, start with this, um, again, sheet metal part that we have. Now, this, in this particular example, I'm just going to show you how we can uh, drive our model using an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and let me see if I can bring the workspace so I can show you uh, where the, what this spreadsheet looks like. It might be in workspace here. So this spreadsheet can be as complex as you like, but I try to keep it simple so that it makes sense, it's easy to understand. So I've got the ID column, which is basically my part number. So according to my part number, I've got different uh, parameters that I want to control using this uh, spreadsheet. Now this can go as far as you like, uh, it doesn't matter, and uh, Inventor will uh, very easily read through that. So these are my different asset variants, if you like, that I'm gonna control uh, through uh, Inventor iLogic. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is go into our uh, into our model, uh, and we've got some parameters for the width and depth. These were just basic um, sort of numeric parameters that I've created and set them to keys. I'm going to add another text parameter and call it ID. So this is going to be basically my, my my part number or part name, if you like. Uh, <coughs> I could set this to multi-value like I would normally with an inventor, but actually there is a, a way we can do that through iLogic as well. So I'm gonna create a new rule and call this uh, parameters rule. If I look at my snippets again, or the, the templates that I have, I know, I know that I wanna manipulate the Excel spreadsheet, so I'm gonna expand the templates for this. Uh, and I'm gonna look make multi-value list from Excel. Okay, so multi-value list for what parameter? If I look at my user parameters, I wanna set that to ID. Go to Excel values, what's the name of my file? So let's copy paste that inside our rule. Sheet one is fine. What are the columns that I'm interested in? Um, from uh, A to to 8.5 or let's say 8.6, A6 to be on the safe side there. So if I press OK to that, and I go back inside my, you'll see that now we have uh, different multi-value lists that have been uh, pulled through from my Excel spreadsheet. Okay, I'm also gonna add a new parameter here. Uh, Maybe this is numeric. I'm going to set it to type. I'm going to set the set it to unit less, so UL, so it's an in together, and set that to one, for example. Make it a key parameter. So this is another one of my columns that I have here from one to two. Okay, and I'm going to go back into my parameters row, and I'm going to set the relationship between my uh, inventor model and my Excel spreadsheet. If I expand my Excel, it's the first one that I need. I need to find row. So it might look a little bit complicated, but it's not actually. Let's replace the file name in here. So what do I want to do? I want to find the row where it, the, the title of the row is ID in this case. Okay, so just type in ID in there. And my condition says that when ID equals, I'm gonna get rid of all this stuff. I want to always, my ID to equal the ID that I have from within my model, okay? So connecting the, the Excel spreadsheet with my inventor parameter. And then I wanna point it to the rest of the columns that I have in the spreadsheet. And I'm gonna use my user parameters, so type uh, width depth return. And what are these? So um, Current row value is the next, so get a value from a row that was just found using the find row function, which I used previously. So if I double click on that, okay, I didn't need the equal sign there. And what is the name? It's gonna be type, because I know if I look at my, I've got the right names for the columns, so just matching those. Oops. 
Okay. And finally, I'm going to update my document. And press OK. So now these have, it might look like we haven't made any change, but let's uh, test this out. So if I switch to my uh, SBHR, R stands for return. We're going to see later on it's a return uh, extension that I will add to my model. But this, you can see my model is automatically updating because it's picking the values for the width. So I'm, I'm in the second, so the width is 195 and therefore my model is automatically updating. And the same thing counts for uh, the rest of JHI. Let's switch to the main one. <clears throat> so that's, now we've got a, a driven model from our Excel spreadsheet. Let's see how we can manipulate some of the features from within Inventor. Um, I'm going to create a new flange, for example, at the end here. Actually, let's try that again. Or well, maybe I'll set that because this is going to be my return. Let's set that to 27 plus. I'm going to use my invent parameters that I have plus return, which is going to be driven from the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and go ahead and press apply. I'm going to create another flange at the end of that. This time it's going to look downwards. And the value for this is going to be 35. Okay, I'm going to pick this last two features I created. I'm going to mirror them to the other side. Now what's important when you working with iLogic is to make sure that you rename uh, that your features that you're creating because it will be easier when you're working within the iLogic environment to pick them up from, from the browser. So SMB1, flange 1, flange 2, SMB mirror 1. Okay. So I want to create a design alternative, uh, and in order to do this, I need to suppress these features that I created and create uh, the different ones at the end. Again, I'm going to use the flange command, set it to zero. But this time, uh, let's do something and set the distance first of all. This time is going to be 29 class return. And this time I want to set this to width, centered, for uh, 20 millimeters. Hit apply. Create one last flange here, so that let's say 90. Uh, I don't need the width extends this time. I, I want to set that to 18. Let's make sure I've got the right bent positions uh, and go ahead and press OK. And like I did previously, I'm going to use my mirror tool to pick these last two features and mirror them across. Rename these. Uh, these are going to be JHI uh, flange 1. mirror one, okay? So I've created these and what I want to do now is to create a, a new row inside my uh, model. So let's move this a little bit to the side. And I'm going to call this uh, ID rule maybe. Okay, so this is going to control my part. Now another way of, instead of using if then else, a similar thing can be done by using what we call select case. It's pretty much the same thing, but it gives you the ability to have more than one or two uh, kind of alternatives to the loop. So select case for my parameter ID. For my first case where ID is set to SBH from the multi-value list, then I want Inventor to uh, suppress or activate some of the features. Again, I'm using my code snippets. 
I'm going to say feature is active. Uh, and if I look, expand my model browser and go back to the bottom, you can see that new features that we created. I'm going to switch to names and just copy all the names on there so they're easier to pick. And set this to true. So my SMB flans will be true. I want to create six of these and then simply just go through and replace the names. And set this to false. Oops. So that's the first case. Uh, and similarly, I can create the, the rest. So if I say for the next case, where it's going to be SBHR, copy all these. Actually, I'm going to create all four of them in one go and just change the names. Let's expand this a little bit. So SBH, SBHR, JHI, JHIR. And these two should be the same. And then we need to toggle these around. So these are false, these are true. select I could also pick it up from here as well okay so that is the code that the different cases that I have so every time the ID changes uh, certain features will be suppressed and others uh, will be activated okay so that's really the the how we can control that so this is a, a SBH if I do the return that will add the return to the end of my frame as well and the same thing counts for the JHI as well. So really quickly creating design alternatives uh, that we gives the flexibility to our design. And one nice thing to do here to uh, uh, actually let's create another rule before we create the, the form for that. Well, maybe we want to manipulate uh, the materials. Okay, I can see some of the uh, comments on your uh, chat here that the audio is, is bad. Um, is it is that still the case? Is it still breaking up? I'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to do here, uh, the next thing is to manipulate the material properties. Um, I want to create um, a couple of new uh, parameters here. I'm going to add a new text parameter and call it material. Make this a key parameter. Uh, let's put an in initial value, uh, galvanized steel. I'm going to add another text one and call it color. Okay. And the color still galvanized as an initial value. And I'm going to create another rule and call it material rule. <clears throat> Back into my iLogic environment, I'm going to use an if then else expression. So if, uh, and the way I'm going to control the material, a good way to do this obviously would be using the thickness of my model. So if my thickness um, is any greater uh, or equal to, let's say, three millimeters, then if I go to my user parameters, uh, my material will be um, aluminium or aluminium, as the Americans say, 6061. 
So that's driven straight from the materials I have inside Inventor. And also my color, you can see, as soon as I got a, a proper parameter, it changes color, which means I'm on the right course. Uh, I'm gonna set this to uh, aluminum uh, machined. Okay, then else if thickness is um, any, let's say, greater or equal to two, and I'm going to copy these two, and I'm going to set them to galvanized steel. And still galvanized. Okay, and one final else condition for here. So for any other kind of value uh, that will for my thickness, then that will be set to uh, steel mild and metal steel. Now this up till now, what I'm doing, I'm simply changing the text parameter inside my uh, inventor parameters. But I, I also want to point this to uh, my eye properties and the actual material parameters that I have. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer some of these questions. I'll, I'll explain what the benefits are with using combination of Excel and uh, and iLogic. I'll address some of these uh, in, at the bottom, at the end of the session as well. So what we need to do is now we, we want to manipulate some of the eye properties, for example, the material, and I'm going to use my snippets again, and go ahead and go into eye properties material. Uh, and I'm going to say this equals to my user parameter material. And the same thing for pipe color, my eye property pipe color will equal to the color para text parameter that I have inside my uh, my inventor parameters and then I'm going to say document update at the end and hopefully if I've got all the naming right that, that should uh, work so if we go to our sheet metal let's change our thickness to 3 and we can see the, the material changes or let's say it set it to 1.5 for example that should hopefully go back to mild steel. Okay, so a nice way to control uh, your part in terms of what the properties of the material and the coloring is. Now the final thing to do for this particular example is to maybe create, to show you how we can create a, a new interface that we can control this from. Okay. Uh, and this is what, where we're going to create uh, our form. Uh, I'm going to bring a group. You can see what the form is going to look like. I've got a new group where I can start bringing some uh, of the parameters inside that. My ID, my width, my depth, the return, and the type. Okay, I'm going to bring another group in here, and this time I want to bring in my material and color. Okay, maybe I want to add uh, a picture to the form. If I highlight my picture and go to the image, um, let's have a look. If I So I've got an image created here. So we've got a nice form that we can kind of control that. Uh, so let's see if we can rename some of these. Our interface form. This is going to be our model properties, or parameters rather. And I also want to change in my interface. I want to change instead of just having a done 
button, I can say, OK, cancel or apply. And you can see what the form looks like. If I click that, we've got our first form. I can create a, a new row, run form. So that's just so that it brings the interface into place. If I expand my forms, it's a very simple row. All I need to do is click on the template and then just type in the name of my form. So that runs the rule automatically. And you can see I can now control uh, my model from here. I can click Apply. I could have maybe brought the thickness in here as well so that we can change that. Uh, and we can see the properties of uh, the material properties change. OK. Now, this um, uh, interface that I mentioned within Inventor, we've got the ability to uh, we have what we call event triggers. So maybe I want to, this uh, form that I created, I want it to appear every time after I open my document. Okay, so run form. So next time I open my document, it will automatically bring me that form and I can enter my configuration that I want and start producing my drawings straight away. So that's in terms of um, sort of part uh, I logic and how we can manipulate some of the Properties, we've seen how we can connect it to Excel spreadsheet. Uh, let me have a quick look at some of the questions here. Okay, so there's a question regarding the, the parameter, the multi-value list uh, added uh, into the ID. No, that's not, you don't have to uh, use the Excel or the iLogic to point it to the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so I use parameter multi list. Um, you can, it's just, but if you have, for example, a, a really massive spreadsheet that you have all the IDs in there, instead of you having to type them, you can simply point the, the cell range and that will give you straight away, we'll, we'll, we'll add those for you. Hopefully, I hope that answers the question. Um, so let's look at our next example. Now, this time I'm going to move into uh, the sort of assembly environment. Okay, and I've got this robot assembly. I want to show you the difference between uh, using iLogic for parts and using iLogic for assemblies. Um, so in this particular example, I've got a, a small frame structure at the bottom of the robot for the base. And if I look at the base itself, it's using a frame generator model and just using a, a skeletal model, just a simple extrusion to uh, be able to manipulate the height. And really, if we look at the parameters in here, this construction axis is what controls the height. And if I look at my the height in here is uh, 550. Um, okay, bear with me. Just lost the chat there for a second. Um, but this parameter only exists in part mode and inside this FR skeleton part. I want to be able, I want to use iLogic to expose this to the sub-assembly and then to the top level assembly so that I can manipulate it from uh, from my top level. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do here, um, let's go back to our actual robot based sub-assembly and create a new row. And I'm going to show you all how we can copy uh, parameters from part back inside the assembly. Um, Let's say uh, frame height. If I use my model browser that I can see inside my iLogic interface, uh, I can dig through. Uh, so if I look at my expand my FR skeleton, if I double click on that, in, uh, iLogic or Inventor will automatically put the relationship or the iLogic code that I need. So. Actually, one thing I forgot to make sure here is that I've actually got a parameter in my sub-assembly that, yeah, so th there is a parameter here called height. Uh, it's not pointing to anything. It's just a standalone. So if I create my rule, and go back into my model parameters, height. So this is from the skeletal model. If I look at my user parameters for the sub-assembly, I can then point it to this one. And that's all I needed to do in order to be able to manipulate this. 
Okay, and then I need to do the same thing uh, if I go to my top level assembly, make sure I've got a parameter for height in here. Make this a key parameter. Let's just type an initial value on here. And I'm going to create a new row. Uh, name it something different. Um, and do the same thing like I did in the previous. So expand my robot base. This time I only need this parameter here. So robot base height equals with my top level parameter height. I'm also going to do a document. I might use this time the update when the document rotate. That's fine. <coughs> Okay, and let's see how this works. Uh, so if I go inside my parameter and change this to say, 150, for example, <coughs> I will see the changes, excuse me, uh, in my top level. Okay. So that's a simple uh, example, but <coughs> even further, to take it a step further, let's look at our, excuse me, let's look at our actual <coughs> robot um, assembly here. <clears throat> what we have here is uh, different constraints that I've created that control the arm movement, for example. It's just simple angle constraints. Uh, you can see the preview here of what that is. So, and I've renamed them inside my model browser so that, I, again, I can pick them through iLogic. We've got one for the arm here, one for the intermediate tool, and there should be one for the base as well. Okay, and I've renamed them so that I can actually bring this into play. So let's go to our in the top level here. And I've created, so these constraints exist within my sub-assembly, okay, my, my, my actual robot. I've created the, the equivalent parameters inside my top level for rotation, extend, tool, angle, and height. Oh, sorry, height we've already spoken about. But it's just so I can point them to here. Um, it'll make more sense as soon as I start creating the, the rule. So let's add a new rule and call it angles. <coughs> so I'm following this uh, similar method like we did earlier. So let's, you can see if I double click on here, robot base. Let's go for the arm, let's go for the intermediate, and let's go for the head tool as well. And like I did in the previous um, set, uh, example here, I'm just going to point these to my top level one, so base rotation. So hopefully the naming now makes a bit more sense. Base rotation, arm extend, uh, intermediate tool and head angle. So just transferring parameters from sub-assemblies to top-level assembly, okay? And it might look like uh, I haven't done nothing here, but as soon as I start creating the form, it will make more sense. So I want to bring in some of, it's just, I guess, uh, explaining the reasons why I'm doing this initially, I, I failed to do that. What I want to create with this iLogic rule is I want to simulate and see uh, the range of where this robot can expand to. If I was to place this into my factory floor, for example, and I want to see the spatial kind of requirements it has when this uh, arm is going to extend and, and start working. And, and that's the reason behind creating uh, this little form that I'm creating at the moment. Uh, so. Actually, let's um, bring extend first. Rotation tool and angle. Okay, but this time instead of just using text boxes where I can enter the value, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside the text box and change into a slider. And if I look at the slider properties, all I want to do here is to set the minimum and maximum values. So when a minimum value of 45 degrees and a maximum for one, uh, one three, five, 
for my ex uh, extend and I want steps of five. I'm going to do the same thing for the rest, change the text box to a slider, expand the properties, uh, minimum value of five, maximum of 150, step of five, tool, uh, set that to five, uh, maximum is going to be 90, and five, and the same thing will be for the angle. Okay, maybe we want to uh, bring a picture like we did in the previous example. Actually, I'm not sure I've got proper image for that. Yeah, it's a little bit big, but anyway. Uh, okay, so let's uh, finalize this. Uh, we're going to create a, a new rule like we did before, run form. Expand our form snippets. So form uh, didn't put a name to it. Uh, now let's go back into our form. Actually, I want to edit that. Robot uh, arm control. And we also maybe want to put some more meaningful uh, explanations here. So main arm angle. This is going to be my base uh, rotation angle. Intermediate uh, arm. And this one is going to be drive head rotation. Okay, create that run form rule. Paste the name into that. So that's going to automatically fire up. And we're going to start. So you can see, we can simulate the movement <coughs> of the arm. We can do the base rotation on the side. We can have the intermediate arm expand, or even the head rotation at the top. So this way, if we wanted to kind of uh, be able to see how far this could stretch, by having something like this, we can really easily kind of see the, the, the special requirements it would have. Or we can even create some uh, animations through this as well. Okay. Uh, and again, we could use this form to trigger and put it under any kind of uh, event trigger like we had previously. Uh, let's look at another example. Um, if we had things like um, content center uh, items, uh, let's look at this particular item here. So going back into, into part mode here a little bit, and we can have our own sort of custom uh, rules for that. If we look at our, our parameters, at the moment, we haven't got a parameter here. Uh, actually, let's move. Uh, I'll show you another assembly example. I should have done that at the beginning. So let's uh, go with the drawer. Uh, let's fire this up. Now, this last example kind of combines uh, I parts and I assemblies uh, with I logic uh, at the same time to kind of give us uh, uh, an overall. So these, if we look at this particular parts, if we open up the sides, this is an I part from within uh, Inventor. And we, if we edit the table for this, all it is is uh, we've brought in our key parameter width, created a part name so it will always have a part name and this is controlled by the member name that is 600 500 400 
And the same thing counts for my base. So that's another I part with three members on here. And one final one for the front, which is a little bit more complex table for that. Uh, basically have different uh, parameters, again, manipulating, uh, suppressing some of the things that we don't want. But these are iPads that have been created in the past and we want to combine all this together and bring some kind of functionality into our top level assembly that will control uh, help us do different asset variants uh, that we can potentially expose this into the shop floor and have customers kind of ordering their own kind of uh, configurations for that. Okay, so let's create a, a new text parameter here and call it with, I'm setting as a text because uh, there's the member names that we want to uh, So we can set initial value, I could make a multi-value on here. Okay, so I'm just looking at your questions. Uh, 600, we're going to add these three values into our multi value list. Okay, and go ahead and we're going to start a new rule uh, and call it type. Um, we want to use this time we are looking for the iParts template. So we want to manipulate iParts. <coughs> and we're going to pick the first template that's called change row. row. So change current row in an iPart or iAssembly. I double click on that. So it's asking me the name of the component. I'm going to switch to names here. Uh, and I'm going to bring this to into play. I'm going to paste it in here. And Actually, instead of just typing the row member in brackets, I'm going to use my uh, parameters for width. So every time I change my width, uh, it's going to look into my iPart uh, and match the name of uh, the member of the iPart with my parameter width. I'll show you how that works. Now, another thing worth mentioning within iLogic, and it's always a good idea, I haven't been doing it in this case, uh, but what we can do is we can uh, set up comments. If you put the this asterisk, you can say maybe controls the size of the uh, drawer sides by part. Now this is always a good practice, and I recommend that uh, because the longer your code gets, you want to be able to kind of see what uh, what its bit of code, uh, bit of code that does. Okay. And I'm going to do another change row again for this time for my base. And again, set that to width actually. So let's see, you can see it automatically. As soon as I press OK, it automatically changes the shape. Uh, as you can see, we haven't yet uh, done the configuration that we need for uh, our the front part in here okay so let's go ahead and do that uh, but in order to do that um, we need to create a, an iLogic variable that will generate the appropriate member because this member name is slightly more complex than the other ones uh, not really complex but it just has it has 600 pm instead of just having the numbers so we want to find a clever way that we can generate the appropriate member name for this uh, to point it to the right uh, design alternative, okay? Uh, so let's create some new parameters for that because um, we also want to manipulate the color and the material and, and some other properties as well. So we're going to create a, sorry, a new text property. Call that color. Make that into a key parameter. Create another one called uh, finish. And one last one, uh, let's call it test for this particular example. Um, okay, don't worry about the values yet because I'm going to control them through my uh, type. 
uh, rule here. Let's press some space. Um, so what we're going to set here, uh, let's set some multi values for this. We could have done it manually. Uh, actually, let's do that manually in case this so doesn't make any difference, but it's probably a little bit easier. Let's say because there's only a few values for that. Color pine. Uh, Sorry, we've got for the color. We've got uh, it's either going to be pine or it's going to be white. Add these two here. The finish we either have a, a, a shaker type or a country type draw. We're going to add these in here as well. We're going to go back inside our rule. And we're going to say, uh, start with an if then else command. So if model param user parameters, if color equals to pine, then I'm going to use just a random variable, uh, dim color, I might call it. So you can see that's um, brown because it hasn't got any connection to any parameters or anything in Inventor. It's just somewhere where I can store the value and at the end, we're going to result with the appropriate part member for the front of our uh, of our draw. Okay, so if if color is pine, then load the number the letter p into this variable. Else, uh, so for any other situation, dim color is going to be white. So we've got, it's a multi-value list, so there's only going to be there's two cases on here. So what does this do? This uh, create dim color variable to control color identifier. Can't spell that. Uh, identifier. Anyway, okay, and uh, the next one is it will bring another if then else. So if my finish equals to P, which stands for, for pi, uh, sorry, so shaker, uh, then I'm going to create another new variable and call it uh, dim finish and load the letter uh, M for that. Now, I'm also going to, one a really cool ability that we can have with iLogic, we can even replace some of the components. So for example, when it's, this is set to shaker, I wanted to have this type of, or, or a different, or sort of modern A type handle. So I'm actually going to replace a part from within my assembly. Not only that, but actually control the constraint for that. So again, I'm using my uh, templates. I'm going to expand components, replace. You can see replace a component. So replace from uh, which part with what part? So uh, in here, I'm going to replace the handle. So if I switch to my names, click on that once, and double click on it, it's going to paste it on here. With the IPT, let's look at what the IPT is called. With the drawer handle IPT. And set that to true. We can control the constraints that are uh, related to this um, under relationships again. Constraint is active. Which constraint is that? Uh, uh, there's only one constraint on there, so it's called angle one. And, and set this to true. So Oh, actually, I can just add it for make sure. Else, if uh, finish equals to country, or actually, we don't even need the excuse me. Uh, so, I just need the else. There's only one condition, there's just two, it's a multi value list. So, else, let's copy all these again. Go back here. So this now is going to be set to T. That's correct. 
And this time I want to replace the handle again, but with the different type handle, which is going to be a drawer and not IPT. Set this to true, set this to false. And if, so that's going to work okay. One last thing I want to do here is to actually, now we've got a dim finish and dim uh, color variables. I want to bring all these together and create, generate my, my part member. So I'm going to create a new variable and call it dim part. User parameters. Um, my dim part is, is going to be compromised. That's just another random variable, but it's going to be compromised by the, the value of width. So let's say 500 plus my dim color. Plus my dim finish. So it could be, for example, 500 pm, which, if you remember from the drawer front, it was the, the actual name of my part number. Okay, and then I'm going to just add these to a parameter inside Inventor. So I've got this parameter now holds the right name that I need to pick from my the front drawer. And in my IPART rules, I'm going to use the change row that we used previously. Now I can finally point it to the drawer front. And this is going to be equal to my dim part. So this will now match. So if I click OK, you can see my model is automatically updating there. And if what I wanted to show you in here, just so that to remind you what the, the variable that we're trying to create was in here. So these are the members and the variable that I was trying to, to match with this uh, bit of code. And that is the resulting parameter that I'm creating with my iLogic code, so 500 PT. So if I want to change that to 400, I want to change that to white, I want to change that to a shaker type. So we've got a really nice design alternatives uh, with just a few lines of code. Okay, so the more you move on and the more you kind of practice with iLogic, uh, you tend to get a lot quicker uh, and better ways of kind of uh, structuring your code in here. So this is probably messy a little bit. I need to put some comments in here, which is always a good practice. So what we've looked up uh, till now uh, is, is pretty much all the basic stuff that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. So let's have a look at our agenda. We did, uh, we looked at inventor iLogic parts, assemblies, the material, uh, suppressed of parts, linked to Excel spreadsheets, and creating forms. Oh yeah, the DWG, that's probably quite a nice one to look at. Uh, if I go to uh, SBH, I might use the complete uh, model in this case, but uh, I'll show you how these are created. Okay, you see, because I've got this part, my form already fires up here, but I don't need it in this case. Um, now, within the drawing environment, we've got loads of uh, things that we can do, but some of the most basic ones is our ability to copy eye properties from the actual part into the title block uh, on here or place it anywhere we'd like in, inside our, our drawing. Okay, so in this particular example, it might look complex, but it's not actually. We're just uh, looking at the particular model. Uh, and picking some of the uh, eye properties from in here. Okay, and then just using the template to point it to the eye properties of, of, of the drawing. So that will kind of communicate and, and bring all the information or some of the custom information that is exists only within the part and expose them into our uh, title block. The other uh, rule I've created here now this is a little bit more complex, but uh, it's going into a, a sort of V, uh, no, it's not, it's still iLogic actually, a tiny, one line of uh, VBA in here. Uh, but this is also a template that you can find inside the custom snippets. Uh, and what will this do is that every time I, I change my 
um, uh, sort of scale for this. So if I set this to one by one, Inventor automatically knows that he needs to update. Uh, so I've changed that it hasn't done anything, but if I run the rule, then the, the, the sheet size has automatically changed to match my, my part. Okay, so we can, there's also rules that you can automatically place views and, and things like that to automate the process. Uh, but that's slightly a bit, a bit more complex. Um, another really neat tool in here is our ability to convert uh, drawings into uh, TWFs and PDFs in, in one go. And again, it might look really complex, but actually we've got all these ready to go. If, I, if you go to your custom tab here and expand my snippets, you've got all these bits of code to publish DWFs, export to IDW, IGES in one single step. And that's all I've done basically. I double clicked on that. If I click at the bottom here just to show you, actually, I'll put some diff. And it's, it brings in the bit of code, and I don't have to change anything apart from the names of the files in here, okay? And not even the names, the, the path of where I want this to go to. So let's see how this works. Uh, if I click OK, it brings me a dialog box and tells me, do you want to create, uh, that's probably on the part level, a DWG file. I'm going to say yes. That's just for vault. Do you want to create the PDF file for that? Yes. And that will bring it to the to the appropriate uh, path that I, that I've chosen. Okay, you can expose the dialog box to control where it's going to go or we'll do different things. So if we go back to our previous example, uh, we can see the PDFs that have just been created on here. <clears throat> okay, so that. I mean, it's really difficult to do uh, demonstrations uh, of iLogic with, without uh, boring everyone. It's all about programming, and it needs a bit of work. But hopefully, with this kind of data sets that I've showed you, you've got some basic knowledge to help you kind of get started with with this type of, uh, of exercises. The the limits there's no limits to this. Uh, I can show you some examples. Uh, let's look, maybe show you a recent example. I've done for a customer. Let's close all these, sorry. Um, let's see what we have here. So this is a, a sort of frame structure that will rooftop kind of frame structure where air conditioning units uh, are being placed and uh, they needed a quick way to kind of create design alternatives. So again, I've used the same kind of methods to create a, a nice little form in here that will help us actually using radio buttons, we can choose what this, at the moment, this unit is one meter and it can hold two air conditioning units. You can see the brackets here. I can switch to, to a two meter one which will automatically add the new frames, create all the end treatments, add the extra um, components that I have on here. I can set it to three. And this I can uh, manipulate the height, for example. Okay, so we've got different applications. It starts from that and, and becomes even more complex. Uh, I'm sure I've got some of them. All right. Let's exit that. Um, I should have had some example opens, but uh, let's see if I can find some. Might actually open this up for any further questions if you had. Uh, I hope you had a, a good taste. Uh, there. I'm going to look at my chat and read through some of the questions here. Yeah, so there's a, a very fair comment about um, adding the, making the form appear every time you open the part. It, it can actually um, create some issues if you want to really quickly uh, place things on a factory floor, for example, or yeah, that's, you, you can choose to run that manually or actually create a trigger on there. If there's any more questions, feel free to kind of um, 
type them through the chat or if not you can let me know and I can activate your uh, your microphones or the voice I'll give you a few minutes to have a think Let's see if I've got anything. I might type in my email address here in case you want to get in touch. Actually, let me give you. Actually, the best way to do it is through uh, Karen or someone from uh, Grey Tech, uh, and kind of I can uh, pick those up. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've got a question for you. Uh, on creating a form, I've created standard forms throughout, and once you've created your standard, then that's finished with, because you obviously use copy design, and you put it into a new place, and you create your standard. But if you don't want that form to open up every time you open up the standard part now, is there any way of turning it off or making it so it doesn't open up every time you open your drawing? Um, yeah, so that was uh, literally on the, let me see if I can open up that part. Uh, Workspace on project. That's why this I've got a complete model for that. Yeah, so this, for example, it fired up on here. That was so when hmm. sorry, as you open that drawing up there, you saw the form come up. And that's how you're going to use to create your new part. Once you've created your new part, you're then it's going to be put in a place and that'll be your standard set in stone. But you don't want that form to open up every time you open the drawing up now. You want to be able to mm. have it so it's minimized now. Yeah. Well, first of all, you can uh, take it away from here. So make sure that this um, you untick that so that it doesn't run that. That will stop it from running altogether. Um, will, that be, will that affect only in that part or will that affect globally on any part? Uh, for only for this particular part, um, yeah. If that if that is something that was set when it was originally created, it's on a per okay. part per part basis. Uh, there's another. Can you see the eye trigger there? Um, yes. Yeah, that's another way to run it manually. Um, if I look up my interface rule, I've added this last bit of code here called local trigger and eye yeah, trigger. Yeah, so you could take that. Yeah, so what that does is basically every time you press the trigger, there is a little um, custom parameter called trigger zero. For example, I've run that yeah. four times kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so that's probably the, the yeah. manual way of doing it. Okay, that's great. Is that, is that okay? Cool. Yeah, I've got one more question really. You know when you create a form, mm -hmm. can you... Uh, obviously, you get create a form. You can do tabs and so on. Can you make a form open up another form? Um, yeah, yeah, because you can. Because you can. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking. You're thinking like if you've got an assembly, for instance, I've done I, I logic assembly, and I want to bring in a, a pump, for instance, and then you might want to pick on the form to open another form because you want to add something else onto that pump. Yeah, I just wonder if there's a way of doing that. Yeah, there, there is a, a just out of there probably might be a better way, but the quickest way I can think of is if you maybe put like a radio button on here for your form, like yes. in the previous example, and every time you click on that button, uh, the a parameter inside your inventor will, will change, uh, will change a value. It can be anything, and once that parameter okay. has been changed. You can then have a rule to say that if that parameter changes, then fire up that next uh, form, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. I'll yeah. play that later on. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. No problem at all. That's, I can't see any more questions here. So, with that, I'd like to close the session today. Um, I hope you find some useful information on there. Okay, so there's Karina's uh, email as well if you want to think of something later on and you want to ask a question, feel free or any feedback or welcome. So thanks very much for your time and looking forward to seeing you in one of our next sessions. Take care, everyone.